Our king came before King Roland, and spake he thus, Your Majesty, something must be done about these giants. I shall go out and I shall face them myself, though it may well cost me my life. Well, King Roland grew very sad to hear this proposal indeed, for he very much feared to lose his longtime friend and favorite minstrel. He begged Arkin not to go out, but Arkin was firm of mind. The king sadly resigned himself to offering Arkin the best weapons and armor that the castle had to offer. But Arkin only made a sad face and said to the king, I thank you, Majesty, but all the armor in this castle would only decorate my bones, and I have no skill with a sword at all. No, I shall go forth and I shall challenge these giants in the way that I know how. Well, the king could say nothing in the face of such desperate courage, but only bade him good luck and God speed. The princess, however, she was frantic at the word that she was in danger of losing the man she loved so dearly. As he passed by her sewing room, she pulled him in and sat him down by the window. Why do you do this? She said. Why do you have to go on? Arkin sat, staring out the window for a moment, and then he turned his gaze away from the goat-smeared window and looked at his hands and said, for you, your highness, and for Selenor, if I am to die, then it matters not what I say now. I love Andrea. I could not bear to see any harm come to you. Well, when the princess heard this, her heart filled with sadness and joy, she swept him up in a wild embrace and begged him not to go out. But Arkin was firm of mind and stood to go. The princess stopped him, knelt down before her sewing chest, and removed the long bolt of embroidered silk, stitched with cardinals and blue jays by her hand. She handed it to Arkin, saying, Take this! Take this! As it was to be my wedding train! Take it! And know that my heart goes with you! Well, Arkin took the garment and stowed it in his bags. The very next morning, Arkin rode out to the castle. He wore no armor. He carried no swords, but rode out on his donkey, a singing a song of springtime. He carried not but the princess's silks and his flute. He did not ride long before he came upon the giants. Oh, they were sitting in a circle telling nasty stories and squeezing kittens into cheese. When the giants saw him, they were confused. Here was no warrior. He wore no armor. He carried no sword. Well, this got their curiosity up, and so they lowered their horrible clubs. The meanest, nastiest, scraggliest ogre with long, tangled, greasy hair spat out some kitten bones and spake thus. Well, 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 he said. What's all this then? Order see no weapons. Order see no bits of swiney stuff on you. Have you come to die, little man? Oh no, goodness me. But I'm no warrior, as you can see. I'm simply a musician. And I've been listening to your singing all night. And I thought that I might offer a sort of musical contest. Ha ha ha! That is me joke, little man. You beat me at anything. I think you get good with kitty keys. What? Don't tell me you're afraid that you shall lose. We hear nothing. You want to play games? We play games. But what do we bet? This cheese is dry. Maybe 
when you lose, we pop your head off and drink you like wine. And when I win, you must promise on your oath as giants to leave this kingdom and never return. Well, the giants all had a really good laugh at this boldness of the fellow. And they promised on their oath as giants that they would do exactly as Arkin said if they lost. Now Arkin, being no fool himself, realized that the word of a giant was no word at all, but took the, the giant's oaths in stride. The giants gathered close about him and started to drool. Now, human, you play your stupid part so that we can eat! No, 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 that's quite all right. I made the challenge. You, you go first. Well, the giants were very happy to hear this indeed, for they full well knew that the sound of their singing alone would reduce Arkin's brain to porridge and make him go mad on the spot. But as they got themselves puffed up and began to get themselves really out of tune, Arkin made a show of shivering and asked the giants if they wouldn't mind if he put on a hat, for it was a bright and chilly spring morning. Well, the giants didn't care one way or the other about it, but patiently waited while Arkin took the princess's silks and wrapped them tightly about his head. And then, the giants began to sing. What can I tell you? The din was hideous! Within the circle, the grass about their feet began to turn brown and molder, and the sunshine within the circle began to curdle. But Arkin stood there with a bored look on his face. Well, this confused the giants greatly. So they began to sing louder and, and much more out of tune. All around them, in the air, birds dropped in mid-flight and fell dead like stones. And the earthworms beneath them began to tremble. But Arkin sat there with a bored look on his face. The giants were confused. They began to dance, as they say. Knobby knee jigs and bony in cartwheels. And Arkin just sat there with a bored look on his face as the earthworms at their feet began to burst into flames. Well, the giants, worn out from their nasty exertions, fell in a tangled heap about him. <laughs> Hello, you big How is he? Well, Arkin unwound the princess's silks from about his head and picked up his pipe and said, That was truly awful. You certainly are the worst giant singers I've ever heard. But now it's my turn, if you please. And with that, began to play a lovely lullaby. It was one of his favorites that he used to lull his cattle to sleep on many a winter night. The giants, worn out from their exertions, slowly, one by one, began to nod off. Now, giants singing is pretty hideous, but giants snoring, <laughs> what can I tell you? Their snoring shook the soil and made poor Arkin's earwax boil. But never did he mind, as he quickly set to work. He took the princess's silks and wrapped them around the giants, binding them hand or foot. He tied the knights tight and secure, and then went off back to the castle to find as many villagers with axes as he could. When he brought them back, the giants were still in their, well, their ugly rest. But as they slowly began to wake up, they realized that they had been tricked. They pulled at each other, which only made the knots tighter and more painful. Then the villagers, at Arkin's word, fell upon the giants with their axes, avenging cabbages, farmhouses, and kittens alike.
like. The bodies they decided they would burn, for nobody wanted to poison the soil with the foulness of their carcasses. So they soaked them in oil and set them ablaze, and the smoke that arose from the fire was a greasy pall that hung over the land. For three days and three nights it burned and mouldered. On the fourth day, the wreckage was cleared away, and the villagers were amazed to find that there, amidst all the bones and greasy body parts, the princess's silks were still intact, right down to the stitching of the blue jays and the cardinals. She wore it that very night as a bride to be wed to the bard she loved so dear. That very night, Roland retired his kingship, confident that he had placed his kingdom and his daughter in loving and capable hands. Now the princess's silks, yellow though they were, became a cherished family heirloom, and all that are in my story lived happily, if not ever after. Thus, good lords and ladies, is my story ended. Go back to your mundane lives now and speak to others of what you have seen and heard in this time, in this place. And, of course, if you truly enjoy my story, you may show your appreciation to my bag of coins. Oh. Perhaps later, then. Until we meet anon, I remain, take nightfall, at your humble service.